Hello, welcome. In this video, we're going to be talking about intoxication as a defence in criminal law. Now, this is a capacity defence. It's obviously aimed this video at A-level law students. But it's capacity defence, which means it's going to affect the ability of the defendant to think in a particular way or act in a particular way or affect the decision making. So in this, we're going to be looking at specific and basic intent offences and identify the key differences between voluntary and involuntary intoxication. Of course, we need to explain some key cases as well, and we should be able to apply problem questions, uh, the law to problem questions. Of course, there are separate videos on how to do that, but you should be able to do this with the knowledge. Now, introducing what intoxication is then, this is something that covers alcohol, for example, but also drugs and other substances such as sniffing glue. Anything which impairs the defendant could be an intoxicant. Now, ultimately, the defendant must have been so intoxicated that he was unable to form the mens rea of the offence, and that's what we're trying to prove. Now, therefore, usually evidence is necessary to show more than a little was consumed. Which means then, of course, for problem questions, you're looking at a defendant drinking an amount of alcohol which is not ordinary. So, for example, they might say 20 pints of lager, or they might say an excessive amount of drugs. And so it's up to you then to spot that that is a defence in any scenario. Very unlikely that they're going to ask you in an exam question to explain and apply the defence of intoxication. It's up to you to spot it. So the law on intoxication is largely based on policy. Because if we think of intoxication, of course it's a factor in most violent crimes. Now, there has to be a balance also between the victim and the defendant's rights. Now, if intoxication was always available, the victim would never be protected in law and there would never be any justice when there has been a particularly violent crime, for example, or a series of crimes. So the result there is that there's, there's a conflict between public policy and legal principles. On the one hand, we have public policy which is based on public protection and encouragement of good behaviour, but legal principles impose liability with this fault, but where fault is voluntary or there's an assumed risk. So we've got a difference between the two there. Now balance is attempted, but public policies become more prominent. So for example, if we look to section 76, subsection 5 of the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act 2008, the defendant can't rely on any mistaken belief attributable to intoxication that was voluntary, voluntarily induced when claiming any of the defences within that act. Therefore then, whether the defendant is guilty of an offence depends on whether the intoxication was voluntary or involuntary and whether the defence charges one a specific intent or basic intent. So we've got a sort of combination there. We've got voluntary intoxication and specific intent offences involuntary intoxication of specific intent offences or the opposite. So there are four sort of combinations there. We need to be able to predict what's going to happen in each of them and we should be able to by the end of this video. So we need to remember the levels of intent then. So specific intent offences are offences which need intent so it cannot be done recklessly. And that's important when we're considering whether the alcohol or other intoxicant has affected the ability to form mens rea for the offence. Now, what are basic intent offences then? Well, these are offences which recklessness can satisfy the mens rea. So we're going to go and explore different offences so we can have an idea of what is expected for both and for each one. Now, this is important as the defence behaves differently where voluntary intoxication is concerned. So the law draws a distinction between crimes or specific and basic intent as we've outlined. Now for the purposes of AQA this may not be applicable to your course if you come from, from elsewhere. But in terms of murder we know that is a specific intent offence. And so we've got either to kill or to cause GBH. So it's not a basic intent offence. In terms of manslaughter that's not a specific intent offence. So we've got recklessness will normally suffice because it's uh, you know either gross negligence or it is an unlawful act and of course we only need a mens rea for the unlawful act in that situation. Now the section 18 or GBH of wounding, now that is a specific intent offence so we need intent to cause really serious harm or to resist lawful apprehension of a, an offender so it's not basic intent but all other non-fatal offences are basic intent offences so we need to be aware of those.
So the key themes then, the key things we're going to look at are voluntary intoxication. And like we say, this behaves differently when it's a specific intent crime or basic intent crime and can be used for one or the other. But involuntary intoxication, it remains the same. So involuntary is, as you suggest, you're not, in, not voluntarily intoxicated. So it sort of takes some blame away to some degree. And then we're going to look at the idea of intoxicated mistake. So we're going to begin then with voluntary intoxication. So broadly speaking, this is where a defendant has chosen to take the substance or knows the effect a prescribed drug will have on him. So we need to consider voluntary intoxication with both specific intent offences and for basic intent offences. So we're going to start with voluntary intoxication and specific intent offences. What's the relationship between them? Now, if the defendant was so drunk that he was incapable of forming the intent required, he could not be convicted of a crime which was committed only if the intent was proved. Now, that was the original test from DPP and Beard. But the new position has moved towards the direction from Sheehan and Moore. Now, the true test then is whether, because of intoxication, the defendant did not form the intent, irrespective of whether he or she was incapable of doing so. So it did not form the, the intent. So looking into this case in more depth, or she in a more, in this case the brief facts where the defendant was drunk and poured petrol over a homeless man and caused his death. Now the question is, did the defendant form the mens rea or was it drunken intent? Now if you have drunken intent, that is still intent, it's still mens rea. Now the prosecution wasn't able to prove that they'd formed the mens rea for murder, so the specific intent to kill or to cause GBH because of the intoxication. And so he was charged instead with and convicted of unlawful act manslaughter. Now if there was an alternative basic intent offence, what would normally happen is the defendant is charged with both and it's left for the jury to decide whether the defendant had the mens rea for the specific intent offence or the basic intent offence. Now, what we got then, for example, as you've just seen in Sheehan and Moore, you've got the defendant could be charged with both murder and manslaughter. If we can, can't prove the mens rea of murder, so the intent to kill or cause GBH, then we can prove manslaughter instead. And that is because that can be done recklessly. And the idea is to fall back a fence. And the same with Section 18. We know that's a specific intent offence, but Section 20 is a basic intent offence, which can be done recklessly. Um, and what we've got is... Becoming intoxicated voluntarily is what we would consider a reckless course of conduct. So that would satisfy the recklessness for the offence. So it's very flexible in its approach, the law. But the prosecution could do this then to ensure conviction for at least the lesser offence, like the case of Lippmann. So Lippmann, the defendant and the girlfriend took LSD. The defendant thought his girlfriend was a snake at the centre of the earth and attacked her, causing a death and shoving bed sheets down her throat. Now, he could not be convicted of murder due to the lack of mens rea. You know, he was so intoxicated from LSD. But he was convicted of unlawful act manslaughter because he'd taken the LSD voluntarily. So by taking the LSD voluntarily, this is considered a reckless course of conduct and that substitutes the reckless element for a basic intent offence. So, the simple, like we said, Section 18 could have a fallback of Section 20. The problem is, not every offence has a fallback option. So if you have intoxication plus theft and the defendant is unable to form mens rea for theft, there is no fallback offence and it would just be a not guilty. But we do need to remember drunken intent is still intent, like as was seen in the Attorney General for Northern Ireland and Gallagher. In this case, the defendant decided to kill his wife and bought a knife and a bottle of whiskey to, for Dutch courage, it was called. And so, of course, in this case, by doing that and killing just because he was so drunk, it doesn't mean he didn't have intent. He had intent, but it was drunken intent. So we've looked then at voluntary intoxication and specific intent offences. We already have jumped a little bit into the relationship between the fallback offences. But ultimately, voluntary intoxication can be a defence for specific intent offences. But there is the idea of a fallback in some cases. Voluntary intoxication, so becoming intoxicated voluntarily, is not a defence to basic intent offences. Now, we touched upon this reckless course of conduct already, 
but that's what it is. So becoming intoxicated in itself is reckless and would satisfy the recklessness level of mens rea. So for example, if we're committing, I don't know, let's say a battery. Now the mens rea for that is to intentionally or recklessly apply unlawful force. If you become so drunk that you do this, then of course you're being reckless, aren't you? You're lowering, lowering those inhibitions. Uh, becoming drunk has its risks. Becoming high has its risks. And that is reckless. So that's a justification for this, this idea of substituting the recklessness to do the thing for recklessness generally instead. So Majeski is a key case here we've seen this case already in a couple of other capacity defense videos and we know that in this case the beginning of the sunday morning and continuing till monday night uh, robert majeski went on a 36 hour drink of drugs marathon over that time he consumed a combination of barbiturates amphetamines and alcohol now on monday evening he got involved in a pub brawl and assaulted the customer the manager and several police officers who were sent to deal with him he was eventually arrested and charged with three offenses of assault occasioning abh and three offences of assault the police officer in the execution of his duty. Now his defence was that he was suffering from the effects of alcohol and drugs at the time. And he claimed he was so intoxicated that this prevented him from seeing the consequence of well, foreseeing the consequence of his actions, that he was therefore not reckless in the Cunningham sense, the idea of subjective recklessness, and he was not guilty. But the trial judge ruled that intoxication was only a defence to crimes of specific intent and that since the accused was charged with basic intent offences, his intoxication gave him no defence. Again, this idea of being becoming so intoxicated is a reckless course of conduct. Now, the authority for this is this case, it's Majeski, so use this when you're looking for legal authority to support your viewpoints. The problem is, if the defendant doesn't realise the strength of an intoxicant, then you still could use the defence. Because of course, if you don't know the strength of the intoxicant, then you are not being reckless. So therefore, cannot satisfy the recklessness element for a basic intent offence. So in Allen, the defendant drank some homemade wine, which he'd had a much greater effect on him than anticipated. Now, while under the, under the influence, he committed some sexual assaults. Now, he claimed he was so drunk he didn't know what he was doing, and he argued he was not drunk voluntarily. Now, the intoxication was voluntary in this case. However, sexual assault is a basic intent offence, so he's unable to use intoxication as a defence. So, in this case, he's drank the homemade wine, but we've still got this idea of, even hypothetically, we could news that the courts are going to still be reluctant to allow this to be used for basic intent offences. So we're now going to look to discuss the idea of involuntary intoxication. Now, essentially, involuntary intoxication is when a person becomes intoxicated because either they don't know the strength of what they're taking or it's a drug they've been prescribed that they don't know the effect of. But the good thing about this defence for some defendants is, is it can be used for both specific and basic intent crimes. Because, let me know, we're not reckless in committing the crime. Or indeed, is it becoming a reckless court of conduct? Now, if the defendant become intoxicated through no fault of their own, then they're allowed to argue they didn't form the mens rea. So we've got an example here, haven't we, in the picture. If someone spikes a drink, then of course you are not taking the intoxicant voluntarily. Now, the prosecution can prove the defendant did form the mens rea, even though they would not normally have committed the offence, they'll still be guilty. So in Kingston, which is a case here we're going to look at, the defendant was a middle-aged businessman. Now, he admitted paedophilic and homosexual tendencies, which he was unable to control whilst intoxicated. Now, this presented an opportunity for a former business associate of his to blackmail him. Now, as part of a setup, both the defendant and the 15 year old boy were lured separately to a flat and they were both drugged, so voluntary intoxicated there. Um, while the boy fell asleep, the defendant was intoxicated but not unconscious. Now, in this condition, the defendant was encouraged to abuse the boy, which he did, and was photographed and tape recorded doing so. Now, in the prosecution's view, there was evidence that the defendant, despite the effects of the drugs, intended to touch the boy in circumstances of indecency, and the jury agreed. So, again, an unusual case in that there is involuntary intoxication, 
but the still drunken intent or intoxicated intent so the defense could not be used. Now, if the defendant didn't have the necessary intent or had not been reckless in becoming intoxicated generally, he will not be guilty because there's no mens rea for basic or specific intent offense. So we looked at Hardy um, earlier on in a, a different video, uh, but we going to look here in the context of intoxication so the defendant here had been living with a woman in a flat but the relationship ended and she wanted him to leave now becoming upset he took some valium which he'd been prescribed for the woman to calm his nerves now he started the fire in the bedroom while the woman and her daughter were in the living room now he was prosecuted for damaging property with the intent to endanger life or being reckless as to whether another life would be endangered which is arson um Contrary to section 1, section 2 of the Criminal Damage Act of 1971. Now on appeal, the court stated that as the accused didn't know the drug would make him react such a way, i.e. it was not such common knowledge it would cause unpredictable and violent behaviour, because it's normally sedative. Now in this case, it was held to have a defence, because he didn't know the effect, so he was involuntarily intoxicated, despite the fact he voluntarily took the intoxicant. So the final issue we need to address is that of intoxicated mistake. So what we have here is, if the defendant is mistaken about a key fact because of his intoxication, then it depends on what he's mistaken about in terms of raising a successful defence. Now where the mistake means he's not formed the mens rea, then it can be used for the specific intent offence, but not for the basic intent offence, because of course, consistently becoming intoxicated is a reckless course of conduct and can substitute recklessness for those basic intent offences. Now, where the mistake is about another aspect, for example, the amount of force needed in self-defence, the defendant will not have a defence. So, we've got the case of the Crown and O'Grady. The defendant and the victim had been drinking and they fell asleep in the defendant's flat. Now, the defendant claimed to have woken with the victim attacking him, so he picked up a glass ashtray and attacked the victim. Now the defendant tried to use the defence of self-defence, but this failed as he made a mistake while being drunk as to the amount of force necessary, so he was convicted though of manslaughter rather than murder, but this was not, the defence was not successful, we know intoxication is a successful full defence. In Hatton, the defendant had drunk over 20 pints of beer and went back to another man's flat. Now we found the victim dead the next morning through injuries caused by a sledgehammer. And the defendant said he couldn't remember what had happened, but thought the victim had attacked him with a five-foot stick and he defended himself. Now a drunken mistake here, again, about the amount of force in self-defence is not allowable as a basis for the defence. And we used O'Grady as an authority here and applied in the case of Hatton. So what we got is the intoxication here was as the mistake through intoxication was about the amount of force necessary and we know this will not be a defence. Now further to this, there is a separate video on self-defence which is considered a necessity or general defence. Uh, you can look to that video for more information on self-defence and the defence of lawful force. Now in terms of the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act, we referred to this earlier on in the video. But mistaken belief caused through the defendant's voluntary intoxication cannot give a defence to self-defence, defence of another or prevention of a crime. But under section 76, reasonable force may be used for the purposes of self-defence, but section 76.5 tells us it does not enable the defendant to rely upon any mistaken belief attributable to intoxication that was voluntarily induced. So if you're drunk, you make a mistake about the amount of force, you cannot use the defence. But there are exceptions to this general rule. In the case of Jaggard and Dickinson, which is a criminal damage case, the defendant was drunk and accidentally went into someone else's house thinking it was her friend's house. Now she broke a window to get in, but her conviction was criminal, for criminal damage was quashed as she was allowed to rely upon her mistaken belief. It didn't matter if it was drunken. So this exception is specifically because of Section 5 of the Criminal Damage Act in 1971 has this built-in defence. Now this is beyond the spe uh, specification for a QA level law, but nevertheless outlines this point. And what it says is the defender will not be guilty of criminal damage if he has an honest belief that a person to whom the property belonged would have consented to the damage or destruction as a lawful excuse, whether or not the belief is justified. 
So being drunk, you might imagine that means the belief is not justified, but it doesn't really matter in this case. So once again, this is not really applicable to AQA level law, but it, it does help us understand this idea of the, the concept of mistake. And when I mean the part, I literally mean just this part about Jagger and Dickinson. So to sum up then, uh, we're just going to consider specific intent offences. We're going to consider basic intent offences and the effect of the different type of intoxication. So if we've got specific intent offences, for example, murder, section 18, GBH of wounding or theft, then voluntary intoxication, if that is the case, the defence can be used if the defendant is, is incapable of forming the mens rea. But it's likely instead that he's going to be guilty of a fallback offence. So, for example, we've got, you know, the likes of manslaughter for murder or section 20 for uh, section 18. But again, no fallback for theft. If the defendant is charged with a specific intent offence and is involuntary intoxicated, now the defence can be used if the defendant is incapable of forming the mens rea. But if a defendant can still form the mens rea, then that's just drunken intent. And of course, you can still be guilty like in Kingston. Now for basic intent offences, so that's all of the non-fatal offences, so assault, battery, assault occasioning ABH and GBH section 20, and indeed also manslaughter, then if the person is voluntarily intoxicated, then the defence cannot be used. Quite simply, because becoming intoxicated is a reckless course of conduct, and this would lead to the idea of recklessness being substituted for that offence, indeed for the, um, before the reckless course of conduct instead of recklessness for the offence. However, if it's a basic intent offence the defendant is charged with and it's involuntary intoxication is the reason for the intoxication, then the defence can be used if he's unable to form the mens rea. But again, if he can form the mens rea, then he's still guilty. That's just drunken intent. So again, just a different way of looking at here. So we've got the voluntary intoxication, involuntary and the drunken mistake. And then we've got the relationship to specific intent crimes and basic intent crimes. Now, we dealt with all this, but you can use this, uh, you can pause it here if you wish to use this as a guide instead. Okay, so to sum up then, intoxication is no defence, despite the intoxication, if you form the mens rea, that's just drunken intent. Where the defendant was involuntary intoxicated and failed to form the mens rea, the defendant is entitled to be acquitted, so not guilty of the crime. Where the defendant was voluntary intoxicated and failed to form the mens rea, then the defendant is entitled to be acquitted if the offence is one of specific intent. But if the offence is one of basic intent, then the jury must consider whether the defendant would have formed the mens rea had he been sober. So that's it. There's some summary of intoxication so far. We need to consider whether it's voluntary intoxication or involuntary. We need to consider basic intent offences or specific intent offences and then we can decide what our outcome is going to be. Now of course we do need to be aware of the idea of the fallback. If this is raised in a non-fatal offences scenario or murder scenario for example then there could be some combinations for example with diminished responsibility but always consider that fallback so this may trigger the defender being guilty of another offence instead. We need to be absolutely clear about that when applying the law. Okay, thanks for watching.